Andrew Mellon and you're listening to the Celtic Soul Podcast. You're all very welcome to episode number 56. My guest on the show today will be Peter Hooten, singer, songwriter and the frontman of Liverpool band The Farm. Peter was a pioneer in the fanzine world when he brought out The End, which inspired many, many football fanzines from the early 80s onwards. He's a committee member of the Liverpool pressure group Spirit of Shankly and just to keep busy over the years he's written a couple of books and he's also made a documentary on the casual scene. Thanks to everybody who has sponsored the podcast so far. No sponsor for this episode. And like the fans in folks, this is supported by Celtic Minded Businesses, Supporters Clubs, and of course Celtic fans. So thank you very much. And if you know anyone who would like to sponsor the podcast, be it a Celtic Minded Business, a Celtic Supporters Club, or a rich uncle or auntie, we would love them to sponsor the podcast. So get in contact with us at info at CelticFansin.com. You can also contact us through the website or message us on social media. If you're a listener or a reader, or both, you can support our independent Celtic media platform by visiting CelticFansin.com, where you can become a member, subscribe, buy, or donate for the price of a pint. Your support will help us to continue to produce quality independent fan journalism, fanzines, podcasts, video content, and when we can, fan events, when we get back after this vaccine kicks in. Keep the comments coming in, folks, for guests you'd like us to get in for a chat, and we'll try and get them on and dig into the Celtic soul. Here's a few comments we received since the last episode. First comment comes in from Kieran Kenny from Nave Park Celtic Supporters Club up in Dublin. I'm not alone in saying huge credit for the last podcast with Charlie from the Blarneys. It was particularly refreshing given the week we had and all the bullshit we had to listen to post-Lennon. Well done. Another quality podcast. What an interesting character Charlie Feely sounds. When he talked about living in Kerry and the Irish language, my dad was a Kerry man and he used to say how the Lisbon Lions loved their golfing trips to Waterville back in the day and how well they were received by the locals. Very interesting in Charlie's musical background and his early life in Glasgow and what he and his family had to endure, like so many of the Glasgow Irish, no doubt. You can see why Celtic means so much to Irish in the city. Charlie's trip to paradise when he was young and the welcome sight of the tricolour was moving. I'm going to make an effort to listen to the Blarney and Pilgrims more as a result of this cracking interview. And I can sit from Tony in Sunderland. Thank you very much, Tony. My good friend Hilly says, Charlie was outstanding on the podcast. David Gartland says, I've been binge listening to the podcast the last few weeks. They've been a godsend when I've been driving around in my taxi with no customers. We hear you, David. Yeah, it's tough for everybody that works in the hospitality travel, I suppose, trade. We had Eddie Toner on the podcast a few weeks ago and Eddie told us how hard it was to make a few bob in the black cab in Glasgow. Hopefully, David, things pick up now with the vaccine and you won't have time to be listening to podcasts. You'll be that busy. Love the podcast. Always wondered where Charlie ended up. Remember seeing the Blarney Pilgrims in McNeese and Scruffy Morphys in Cope Bridge on a Saturday night in the early 90s. Good to hear you again, Charlie. Hail, hail. And that comes in from the Bronx Boys, Celtic Supporters Clubs on Twitter. JB on Twitter says, Every episode is brilliant. While own just a boy on Twitter, you will never be disappointed listening to these pods. Good podcast, one of the best out there. And that comes in from C. O'Brien, Harry Popboy on Twitter. Listen today, some great stuff from Charlie. Seen the Blarney on both sides of the Irish Sea. Top rebel band and would love a reunion gig if they can be done. And that comes in from J. Boy on Twitter. It was brilliant to hear Big Charlie again. The Blarney Pilgrims set the scene in Glasgow. It brought back a lot of memories seeing them back in the day. Great choice of guest. And that comes in from Glasgow Warren, which I believe is a Scuntop fan. Hi, Andrew. Just to say the interview with Charlie was was the best podcast yet. It brought back so many memories of when I started going over in the 90s. My first ever trip over was the first league match back in Parkhead in 95 against Motherwell. Two Nave Power coaches went... And one of them picked up yourself and Hillier and the other lads from what would become your supporters club. Think then we picked up another supporters club in Belfast. But great days and my first trip over will always have the added bonus of Dublin winning the all Ireland against Tyrone the Sunday we got home. Keep up the good work and I look forward to the podcast every Friday. That comes in from David. Hey, just a message to say I've discovered the podcast today and I've already listened to a few. Andrew is passionate about Celtic. And I'm looking forward to listening to as many as I can, hearing other Celtic fans talk about their own experiences of a great club. It's brilliant. And it's like sitting in the pub sharing stories. Hopefully we'll get that feeling again soon. Keep up the great work. Hail, hail. And like I was with Matthew Dockley on Twitter. Really enjoyed Charlie Feely on the Celtic Soul podcast. Brought back so many memories of the bus trips with Ernie Skeff, the boat, and all the little groups holding court in their own sections, like the Mafiosa. Brilliant times. Thanks, Big Ernie, my friend, for many years. R.I.P. And that comes in from Kieran Bell. 
yeah, Kieran, we missed the old boat and the Jim Mervin and Jim Green and, and Hilly and Nave Porrick and all the groups that used to have the little corners on the boat and the queues for the bar on a busy day. Great memories. Thanks, brother. Loving the podcast. By the way, keep the flag flying. And that comes in from Sean O'Farrell in Philadelphia. Sean also goes on to say, I somehow missed the Kieran Kenny one. First time round. Listened to it the other day. Looking forward to getting home and taking my nephew on the chariot for the first Celtic game. He's flirting with Man United now, so we'll need to stop that. Sean, I'll be looking forward to seeing you again in Philly, never mind Dublin. Well, folks, John Kennedy marked his first game in charge with a win. It wasn't pretty, but a 1-0 win anyway after an early Eddie goal. Hopefully he can do the business again against Dundee United. But I suppose the best news is that the Scottish Cup is back on and we have a chance of silverware this season. So if the players are listening, get your finger out, boys. Get stuck in and maybe make this season not as bad as it has been for us. Young Connor Hazard has signed their contract, the two-year contract. Connor, of course, was the hero of the Scottish Cup final this season, for last season, if you know what I mean. And Premier Sports, again, will be showing them games. I think we have to wait for the winners of Falkirk and Arbroath to see who we play. But it will be televised, I'm told, on April the 12th or 4th. And there's not really that much happen, folks. If, but if you go onto social media, we are linked with every single manager who is either unemployed, about to be unemployed, or just happens to have a passing interest in Celtic. People keep asking me who my choice would be. I don't know, and that's the honest answer. I don't know who's available. I don't know who the club are talking to, and I don't know how these people are getting their information to know because the club have said absolutely nothing. So here's what I think of the manager position at the moment. Blah, 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 blah. My guest on the show today is Peter Hooten, singer-songwriter and the frontman of Liverpool band The Farm, a pioneer of the fanzine scene when he started the end in the early 80s, which would inspire many football fanzines. He's a committee member of Liverpool fan pressure group, Spirit of Shankly, and just to keep busy over the years, he's written a couple of books and also made a documentary on the casual scene. Hi, Peter. You're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. It's been a long time since Peter Hooten strolled onto the stage in Dublin's SFX back in 1987 and introduced himself and the band, The Farm, to Ireland. I was a teenager in the audience that night when you supported the House Martins at my first, I suppose, real gig. And I've followed yours and indeed Paul Heaton's career since. But outside that night, uh, it was so exciting. Badge sellers, bootleg tapes, T-shirts, ticket totes and political groups all vying for my teenage attention. <laughs> Well, that's a great introduction. How'd you follow that? Yeah, I remember that gig, 87. It was like, it was crazy because, you know, we got our big break with the House Martins going on tour with them. And Dublin was especially um, significant for us, you know, because we loved the city. And uh, But we ended up, um, we didn't have much money at the time. So we ended up staying in DOS houses on the tour, really, you know, wherever we could get. And we ended up in a flea pit in Gardner Street. In the uh, which is notorious, but I think we got in one of the worst places in Garden Street. But it was so funny at the time, we were just taking the piss. We thought this is rock and roll, you know, we're uh, surrounded by uh, all sorts of uh, char- characters, should we call them? <laughs> but yeah, what a gig! SFX, what a venue! It was absolutely brilliant, you know, and uh, totally different atmosphere. We played, I think we played the Ulster Hall as well that tour, but uh, you can, re- you know, we c- you could obviously relax and uh, we could relax in Dublin, whereas in uh, Ulster, I think there was a um, there was another support band on when it's called uh, North of Cornwallis, and a lovely singer, and he was ended up with Norman Cook, I think, um, Fat Boy Slim, he ended up doing stuff with him, I think, but he went on to the, and he, he obviously was politically unaware, and he went onto the stage in the Ulster Hall and said, hello, uh, uh, hello, Ireland, I heard you've been uh, having a bit of trouble. <laughs> And we were all backstage laughing our head off. There was booing and people started throwing things at because he'd said Ireland for the first, you know, and uh, it was it was brilliant. But what a tour that was. And uh, Paul Heaton and Stan and and uh, Norman Cook were brilliant. So it was absolutely fantastic, you know. And uh, we used to go after every gig, we'd go to uh, a nightclub where Norman was DJing. And it was like a bit of an interest then. He wasn't a massive DJ. Obviously, he was just playing his favourite records. But it was only the farmer turn up and a few stragglers. It was like, <laughs> so we had brilliant nights dancing to Norman Cook on our own with a few people from, in a nightclub. You know, it was, I don't yeah. think Paul Heaton and the stand, I think they just wanted to get, get off and get their head down, you know, for the next gig. 
It's funny, yeah. Uh, I remember that band in Ottawa and Wallace, and at that time, Dublin was full of skinheads and yeah. uh, mods and, and rude boys, and I suppose casuals as well. But but you know, you, you see them more at football than you would at gigs. Yeah, and yeah. It, it was kind of around the time as well where music was becoming political within the skinhead scene. So you had oh, right. anti-racist skinheads, you had the Redskins in the social side. Yeah, and then yeah. And you had some, you had some skinheads who were uh, who were leaning towards the right and the likes of Scrooge yeah, yeah. and bands like that. So there was yeah. a big split. And I remember that night there was a bit of tension. And I was oh, coming right. up from you know Drada, so you know, there was none of that in Drada. Like if you you know everyone. Everyone, the punks, the skinheads, the, the mods, they all kind of mixed together because yeah. it wasn't a big enough scene in our town, you know? Because they were all your brothers and sisters. So we, Possibly, yeah. You, you know, know, we're all family probably, but you know, it's, well, it's it was, a big city, you know, it's a lot different, isn't it? Yeah, and, and like when, you, when you're a teenager and you start to go to the big city, it, it is, it's exciting and frightening at the same time, I suppose. But I remember that night the Nottingham Wellers came out and um, they weren't going down too well. And the year previously, I hadn't been at the gig, but the boys were telling me that the Proclaimers had been spat off the stage when they support the house mans. Ah, oh, right. So when news came on, uh, the whole band came on without you and the other short hair, polo tops. You know, and I'm thinking, yeah, they look they look a bit like us. They'll never hear of you, but I said, they'll go down well. They look a bit okay, you know. And yeah. then you, you strolled out and you had long hair and your jumper tucked into your baggy jeans and I went, oh, maybe not. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't have hair. long hair. Well, maybe, no, I, maybe my memory's not great. <laughs> I might have, uh, it wasn't long hair. It was just probably... It was that team and Grant's haircut, one of probably. Yeah, we, we would have called it a mullet, you know. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't a mullet. It was like, yeah, uh, oh, okay. I'll, cool give you the, I'll give you the benefits of the doubt. Well, Certainly wasn't a mullet, but uh, took jeans tucked into, uh, I can't remember that, because we used to take the piss out of that at the end. I, may, I might have done it ironically, you know, but no, I wouldn't have done it. Seriously, you know. Because you're so cool and so into your fashion, you know. Well, we were into football fashion and no one had that uh, jumper tucked into the jeans. And we used to take the piss out of it in the end. So, uh, you know, you never know. Maybe maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, you just blew the place away that night. Uh, and, yeah, and yeah. I remember night. it was a fantastic night that, yeah. I think they did two nights, didn't we? Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was funny. Like, I remember me May saying to me, he said, look, like, See if you can get your brother's doll card. And I said, why? He says, because we'll get two quid back. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the house yeah. man, we're giving two quid back to people in the doll. No, that, that was a great opportunity for us, Dad. And um, our tour manager that day, or that tour, was Simon Moran, who ended up becoming SJM Promotions, who are probably the biggest promoter in Western Europe now. But he was our tour manager at the time, you know, and uh, great experience for everyone, you know. I remember getting... I think I was uh, going for the ferry back to Larn, uh, and, and we'd gone from Belfast to Larn, and we'd been drinking most of the night. But I'd got to bed about, say, four in the morning, but got up at, like, nine, so I hadn't had much sleep. And uh, I got stopped going, you know, to, the, to Larn. And, uh, you know, and luckily I didn't get breathalyzed, you know, but I had one policeman telling me the rules of what, what it was like in Ulster. You know, you don't do this, you don't do that, you know. And it, in the end, I think he must have let me off, you know, when he f- found out we were in a group or whatever. But um, I could have easily got done that day, you know. But it was one of those, we didn't have, because we didn't have money for tour buses and things like that, it was all, everything was cutting corners all the time, you know. It was a great experience, though. Yeah, but it it gave us an, an idea of what the music industry could be like, you know. If you uh, if you started selling records, you know, and I think Paul Heaton and Stan then were going to set up us. They were setting us up with the record label uh, with Polydor and John Williams, who's the head of Polydor at the time, agreed to the deal and everything. And then Stan left the group all of a sudden and uh, went off to write children's books. This was happening to the farm all the time. We just get to the edge of a record deal and some catastrophe or chaos would happen, you know. And because uh, we'd been helped by all sorts of groups, Madness had helped us out. UB40 had helped us out, you know. And uh, and the Outs Martins. After that. We were all a bit disillusioned, I think, because we had the record deal and it was just pulled, the carpet was pulled from under us because Stan went off to uh, to write children's books, so the deal fell through. It was going to be, the label was going to be called the Fair Play Committee and that was going to be the fair, we were going to be the fair signings for Paul Heaton's label, you know. And it was reason it was called a Fair Play Committee it was because that's what was set up in the 60s in America to get black music on, on radio stations, you know. Wow, I didn't know that. And, and it's funny, when you did get your break, it was kind of like... Bush. Yeah, like, and we'd, like, we'd stop caring by then. I think we'd stop caring because 87, we'd been going for like two or three years properly. We'd had a few John Peel sessions. We'd had good reviews in the music press, but we didn't understand the music industry. 
we didn't understand that you've got to employ a, a press agent. Have you got to employ a plugger to get your stuff on the radio? We thought it was a meritocracy. You know, it wasn't until 1990 when we got a bit of back and financially that we were able to afford the press officer. We were able to afford a plugger and we were able to afford to go into studios with proper instruments, really. And I think um, you, you look back at that period and all of a sudden we were four paces. We had four pages in this in the face, which was the style Bible at the time in the UK, you know. Uh, and we had four pages in the face and we hadn't released a record because we had a good press agent. And they were saying, where does this image come from? Where does that street image come from? And it all comes back to the farm with the first to be, to look like that, you know. That's why it irritated us a bit. The people saying, oh, they jumped on the Manchester bandwagon and that. We always looked to Big Audio Dynamite, who we thought were like the future of music. And I think I think we were right. You know, they they took elements of The Clash with Mick Jones and they had Don Letts doing beats. And some of the early records equals MC squared, you know, they were fantastic. The bottom line, they were brilliant. And that's who we look to. It's just that we couldn't afford a sampler and we couldn't afford um, producers that knew how to use samplers, you know, until about 89 that we we were able to afford these things, you know. And when fame happens and success happens, you've been knocking around, you know, football, fanzines, music game. When it happens, and especially from, you know, your political and social background, does it change it? Uh, well, of course, it's got to, hasn't it? That's life, isn't it? It's got to change it a little bit. But, you know, we tried to, we always had this philosophy. I went to see The Clash in Paris. I've seen The Clash for seven nights in Paris. Liverpool just played in the, uh, the European Cup final. We beat Real Madrid uh, in the European Cup final in Paris. And I was with a load of lads who didn't really want to go to the, the Louvre, they didn't want to go to the Palace of Versailles. They just wanted to find shops where they could get training shoes, rare training shoes. And I've told this story a million times, but I thought, I want to go back there and see Paris, you know, because obviously it's a great city. So I went back in the September and uh, I'd read on the enemy the week before that the Clash were playing with the Beat and Wah Heat. So I thought, I wonder if that's near where we're staying. So anyway, we stayed in the same hotel just by the Pigal in the September. And luckily enough, the Mogador Theatre is where they played. And it was literally uh, two, three hundred yards away. So I went down during the sound check and uh, got in. And just the Clash's tour manager was a Liverpool fan and a scouter. <laughs> How lucky is that? It's just fate, isn't it? So I went to the stage door and he, he's, people were like looking at me going, oh, all right, lad, oh, all right, yeah. Uh, so I just walked in and then the tour manager said, uh, are you with Pete Wiley? And I said, well, not exactly. <laughs> Because <laughs> I said, no Pete Wiley then. <laughs> and he said, oh, where, where are you from? I said, oh, Liverpool. He said, do you come to the show tonight? I said, well, if I get a ticket yet. And he said, oh, we'll sort it out with backstage passes. And it was I was in them for seven nights to see the clash, the beat, and why he And it was just like a chance, a chance thing, really, you know. And it, it was unbelievable. And that, that, like, that, that showed me how the clash dealt with people. And like you think, oh, it might have been a public image. It wasn't a public image. I was in their dressing room some nights and before they'd arrived for the venue and I'd be sitting sitting there eating a banana. I was, must have been cheeky bastard, must I? But I was sitting sitting there eating a banana and they all march in with the guitars on the back with the roadies and that. And I says, oh, sorry about that. I was, I was starving. I just grabbed one of them. He said, and Joe Stummer said, hey, man, you take what you like. We're the clash. And I just thought, that is unbelievable. And I thought, if the farm ever do anything, I wasn't in the farm then, it was just starting off really, but if we ever do anything, that's our attitude. We're going to be bunking people in through the window. We're going to be getting them in however we can. And that's what The Clash did. And the last night of that tour, it's amazing because uh, The Clash had like a, an entourage with them of all French punks. It was about two, three, well, about, maybe I'm exaggerating here, about 50 to 100 people following them around the streets of Paris. And they were trying to get into an, a place after hours drinking, you know, a nightclub or a bar. And they went to two bars and they, the Clash said, look, we, we all want to come in. And the door staff said, no, no, the, you know, the Clash can come in, but get rid of the losers. That was all us behind them. You know? And uh, eventually he found a place that had let everyone in because they wouldn't go in unless everyone went in. Do you know what I mean? That's what they were like. It wasn't a PR exercise. It wasn't just a publicity thing. They were a, they were a band of the people. I thought, if the farm are ever going to do anything. And I think the House Martins had that attitude as well, you know. And I think it's because they grew up with the clash being the mentors, you know. 
Yeah, the clash. Uh, my introduction to the clash was an older brother, and I've still I've still all the vinyl. And it's funny, I DJ I DJ in a small alternative venue, and it wasn't me. But when when they when they opened up, they had a little little set of decks in the corner. And they have a framed picture, signed picture of Joe Strummer oh, overlooking the DJ. Yeah, so you're yeah, playing yeah. his music and you've got Joe. And, and when, yeah. if I'm doing something for Facebook or something, I'll always take a little picture of Joe and I've been looked after, you know, I've been looked at. Yeah, the yeah. And the beat as well. I've been lucky enough to see the beat now. The, the, yeah, they were brilliant, yeah. I've seen Rankin Rogers, a lot of mess, and I've seen his beat and I've seen Dave Wakeland's yeah. beat. I haven't seen them together, but, but yeah, brilliant band. And yeah. again, just like you mentioned you before you there as well, the house bands. Mm-hmm. You know, these bands that you kind of, you know, they'd all be in my record collection and I yeah, would have, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and they, they would keep you fairly grounded, these boys, because as you say, look, all come true, <clears throat> walking class and, and, Music was music was an outfall them, I suppose. You know, yeah, 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 definitely. You know, especially like the year before, you know. But anyway, right, we're not just here to talk about music. No. We're here to talk about life, football, yeah. and maybe a little bit of fashion. Now, yeah. Liverpool, like Glasgow, has its famous football teams, but the both cities have also seen an influx of the Irish people during Angota Mo, the Great Hunger. Yeah. Now they went there to build new lawyers themselves in the city. And I've heard you talk before about the Beatles and the Irish connection. I suppose yeah. the Beatles are like outside the football, the most famous thing to come out of the city. Yeah. But can you give me a little bit of background and tell us about the Irish communities in the city? Um, yeah. Because I spent a great day there uh, in a big community centre before we headed on to Anfield and uh, knocked your team out of your way for cup, and which meant we got to a final in 2003, yeah, yeah. Which, which was absolutely magic. But yeah. you know, just just give us, you know, take us to your Liverpool and yeah. the Irish well, influence in that. Um, yeah, I mean the Irish has a massive influence on Liverpool. You know, um, uh, the Welsh was, uh, you know, were said to have built the city with the, you know, the the brick from Wales and Welsh builders came to build the city, but the Irish were basically became the dockers of the city. They became, you know, the port's lifeline, you know. Uh, and my background is of my mum's side of the family, uh, well, my mum's and dad's side, both sides, uh, you can trace back to Ireland. And when, when I've done my family history, it, it all finished, it all stops at about, 1946, 1847. So obviously they came over uh, during that period. My mum's family were very religious. You know, they were like, their parish was SFX in Liverpool city centre, you know. And also there's a place called a Friday. My dad was from a Protestant background, but his mum, his mum, uh, her dad was born in Ireland in Carlo. He came from Carlo. Uh, And her her name was McDonough, but she married Hooton who was uh, basically an English name, I think, from Liverpool, you know. Uh, and his side of the family, had, well, allegedly, he wasn't. He was a painter and decor- decorator, my granddad. But allegedly, some of his brothers were in the lodge or whatever, you know. But So me, me, me McDonough grand married Hooton. And then on my mum's side, they were the Foys, F-O-Y, and the Mileses, M-I-L-E-S. So when my dad... Um, was growing up. He was just brought up. He wasn't brought up religious uh, as such. He was brought up as Church of England, I suppose. But my mum was brought up and probably went to mass nearly every day of her life. I don't know, you know. So when my dad had to get married to my mum in the 50s, not had to, sorry, can I rephrase that? (laughs) When my dad wanted to get married uh, in the 50s, he had to convert to Catholicism because it was unheard of, you know. Liverpool had that um, tradition Irish Catholic tradition and also the Orange tradition, and it was uh, it was massive in, up until probably uh, the sixties in Liverpool, and so we had to convert to Catholicism to get married in SFX. You know, uh, if you look at the, if you, I've got some of the censuses here from the eighteen. This is a great book, the Sectarian Violence Liverpool Experience. If you look at the eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies, the number of people who came to Liverpool. As a percentage of the population, it was more than Glasgow. It was something like in 1861, 1871, I can't remember which census, but 23% of the Liverpool population had been born in Ireland. So just imagine the effect that would have had on a city. I think Glasgow's was a little bit lower. They were very similar, but um, Liverpool had that tradition. And most of the Irish had a, went on to New York or to Australia or whatever, or Boston. Uh, but I think about a third of them stayed in Liverpool. They were probably the ones who couldn't afford the, the passage, maybe, you know. Uh, and the docks became 
uh, an area where they could work because it was unskilled. You were picked out in like a pen system, like on the waterfront, that famous, uh, you know, Hollywood film. Uh, and it was it was in your DNA, really. You know, you were brought up. When I was brought up, remember, when I was in the 60s, all I remember was, you know, a Catholic upbringing, you know, because obviously my mum had, had us brought up Catholics. But I was, my first experience of Catholicism weren't great, you know. We had a local priest who said to us, um, see that bit of rubble there? If you take that up and plant seeds, you can have that as a football pitch. So we did it. All kids, about seven or eight or whatever. And uh, we did it. And it was immaculate about two years later, like Wembley. And we said, Father, can we, are we all right to play for? Oh, no. Oh, no, lads. It's too, it's like a bowling green, that now. It's too perfect. I thought, <laughs> you bastards. That was the first <laughs> letdown I had from the Catholic Church. and But it continued, you know. Uh, and we just thought, I'm never going to treat, I'm never going to trust what a priest says ever again, you know. And he was an old Irish priest. His name is Father Mean. He was an Evertonian and he was also into boxing and he was very uh, strict. But, you know, he was, he was the, you know, never seen a, you know, you never seem to be having a laugh anyway, put it that way. <laughs> he always seen. I remember my dad once in the local club. They had, in the, it must have been in the 70s, this, and they, they had like a, a dancing troupe up doing like, you know, uh, at the social club. And some of the uh, some of the group had hot pants on and he stopped the show. <laughs> and my dad said, and my dad was no, you know, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't into uh, pop music as such. He was more into uh, big bands and all that type of thing, you know, Glenn Miller and all that, you know. But he said, you can't do that. That's their show. And uh, don't you watch Top of the Pops? That's what they're all dressing like, you know, pans people and the and then, no, this is my club. I built this club and they are getting on the, so the, uh, you know, there was murder over it, you know. Then I went to a school run by priests. This primary school I was in called Holy Rose. It was run by nuns. And my mum was a dinner lady there. So I was okay there. I got, you know, I got a few of the perks. None of the school bullies would ever pick on me because my mum was the dinner lady, you know, so they they wouldn't get the extra portions or whatever. Uh, but I was also obsessed with football. That's all I remember. And then, uh, you know, in my first few years, as uh, my first confession and my first Holy Communion, I didn't feel any different. And I thought this was a big letdown for me, you know, a real letdown. I didn't, I didn't feel as if it had been elevated to another plane, you know. So I thought this is this, this is nonsense. This, you know. And then uh, then I heard Bill Shankly speak, and I felt as if he was having that effect on me, you know. So I became obsessed with Liverpool Football Club and Bill Shankly, and he became. You know, my, my spiritual leader, really, you know, and everything he said, you know, everything he did. And it was, and he was obsessed with football. So, yeah, and I ran out of being an altar boy. I was the only grandson who ran out of this, of my grand's family. And uh, the priest come round to the house and said, uh, a bit worried about your Peter. He just, he just, in altar boy induction, he just got up and ran. <laughs> and you know why I did that? Because the priest said, there'll be two masses. There'll be seven o'clock mass and nine o'clock mass. As soon as I heard seven o'clock in the morning, I was out. I ran away. <laughs> no way was I getting up at half six for seven o'clock mass. Fuck that. You know, and yeah, you uh, mentioned Shankly there. We had uh, Johnny Owen on the podcast two episodes ago, and he'd done the documentary with Stan Busby and Shankly. Yeah. And as I said to, to Johnny, I, I watched it because of Stan, but I came away from it, and it was Shankly who left an impression on me because I probably I've read so much and seen so much of Stan. And I, as I said to Johnny, I said, like, if he was my captain of a, of the boxing team or yeah. my union rep I would follow yeah. this man I don't know what it was about him I just thought you know here's a man that knows what it's like to have nothing yeah. and yeah. for 90 minutes on a Saturday at 3 o'clock you have everything you know because life can be mundane and boring and that And but to, you know to go and then he like as I said to Johnny he brought a winning he brought a winning formula so it must have been some awakening for, for Liverpool fans Everything starts with Shankly. I was a bit, you know, I was too young when he first came, but, you know, I, I grew up the later Shankly period. My Shankly period was his second great team in the 70s, you know. But I was, you know, my dad went to match then in the 60s and tells me all the tales. But I did a Boot Room Boys book about Liverpool's Boot Room Boys history, but also did a documentary on Shankly. And we went to Glen Buck, where he was from. It doesn't exist anymore. Because it was a mining village, and as soon as the mine went, there was no reason for it to exist. But Shankly, he had that. He wasn't political as such, but he believed. 
his famous quote where he says, I believe in socialism, everyone helping each other. That's that's what a football team is. Everyone helping each other and no one slacks. And he, and he was brilliant about Liverpool. He said Liverpool was a sleeping giant. You know, Everton with a big club in, uh, on Merseyside there and Everton with the Mersey millionaires. They were the big club. They were getting the bigger gates. They, were, you know, they, were, they could afford players two or three times the amount that Liverpool were paying for players. And it was Shankly who was the catalyst for everything. He was the catalyst for everything. Now, he hadn't been that successful in those other teams like Workington, Carlisle, Huddersfield, you know, we mid table stuff. But I think somebody, I think Matt Busby, this is the irony, Matt Busby recommended him for the job because Matt Busby was a famous captain of Liverpool. And Matt Busby wanted the Liverpool job after the war, but they wouldn't give him the manager's job. They'd only give him chief coach job. And then Man United came in and said, we'll let you be the manager. So he moved to United. But I always say this to wind up United fans, his heart was still in Liverpool. That's why he recommended Shankly for the job, you know. And um, he recommended someone who became United's nemesis, really. Uh, and but it all starts with Shankly. Everything he did, he he got to work on. As soon as he got there, he said it was the biggest dump on Merseyside. I mean, he started painting the ground himself. He started improving Melwood, the training ground. Started painting everywhere, getting in uh, facilities, getting in running water to Melwood. Didn't have running water at the time, you know. He said it was the biggest toilet on Merseyside. But I made sure everyone got together. And the one thing. He had Paisley was already there, Joe Fagan was already there, Ronnie Moran, all these players who became boot room boys uh, were all there. But Shankly come to them and he said, uh, all I want from you, lads, is loyalty. That's what I want from you. Like an armed mafia boss, all I want is loyalty. If, he said, if anyone comes to me with a story about another person, it's not the person they're talking about. It's the person who comes with the story. They're the ones who are out. And from that day on, he just got total cooperation. It was Omerta. Nothing got out the club, out the boot room. You know, and I think, I always remember as a kid, because Shankly loved Jock Steen, we all loved Jock Steen. And we all, you know, know his quote that, you know, when he said to uh, he, he said to Jock after winning the European Cup, now you're immortal. Because he, he he was desperate to win the European Cup, Shankly. I think in 65, when he beat into Milan and then went to the away match, it was a bit like uh, Celtic and Mont- the Battle of Montevideo, you know. Very similar to that in many ways. You know, uh, all the players reckon the referee was was bent. And even Tommy Smith, after, after that match, he kicked the referee up the arse. And the referee didn't even do anything about it. Didn't even report him. That devastated Bill Shankly. I mean, obviously, he was made up for Jock Steen winning it. But I think he wanted to be the first you know, to win it. And then uh, Jock won it. And then Matt Pusby the following year. And Liverpool, even though we won the UFA Cup 72-73, it wasn't really until Paisley took over the team. But Paisley always says that Bill built the foundations. I just put the roof on, you know, and I think that's that's the best way to describe it, you know. And it's it's lovely for Paisley to say that as well, because in the modern day, we, we see managers coming in and, and, and taking, you know, taking all the plaudits, but, yeah, but yeah. the walk has gone in behind, you know, the walk has been, yeah. the manager might have just been close. I yeah. just didn't get over the line because you know managers don't last long now because it's 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 fans just demand success yeah. the whole time now. Yeah. now you mentioned Jock Steen. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we went to um, when we were in this school called the Slesian. It was run by priests, you know, and they were always looking for. They were always going to Slesian places. We went on a trip to London and we played Slesian Battersea and Slesian Chertsey, Slesian Farnborough. But then the following year we had a trip to Glasgow. I always remember it because it was it was about bonfire night, and in Liverpool, bonfire night was like uh, you know it was like Dante's Inferno. You know, it was like streets had competitions against each other. But when we got to Glasgow, it didn't seem to be as big as, and we were all talking about it. So that's how I remember it. But then on the Friday, uh, we hadn't played the game. We were playing the first game was the Friday afternoon, and then the Saturday morning, then the Sunday morning. On the Friday, we went to uh, Parkhead. And we went in and we met Jock Steen in, in the uh, changing rooms and he shook our hands. And I'm sure we got a photograph of him. So I, I, I lost mine, you know, but he said, uh, look forward to the match tomorrow, boys. We're playing uh, Aberdeen. And we didn't know, but the, the priest said they hadn't told us that we were going to match the next day. You know, it was a bit of a surprise, I think. But it was. I always remember that trip to Glasgow because uh, this was the infallibility of the priests as well again. We took training shoes, but we also took screwing football boots, you know. 
We didn't have Moldies or anything with us, but we played. We always used to play on grass in Liverpool, but in Glasgow, they played on shale. So I was the uh, captain of the team. So I, everyone was going, we're not wearing boots, we're wearing our trainees. And I went to the, uh, the main priest and said, uh, look, everyone wants to wear the training shoes. Oh, no, you can't wear training shoes. So what do you mean you can't play with? You can play with Moldies on this. You can't play with... We've got all these new screwing studs, you know. They, they probably didn't even know what screwing studs were. Went, no, no, you play football with football boots on. So we played these teams from Glasgow. We were like fucking on ice, do you know what I mean, with screwing <laughs> studs and that. We couldn't turn or nothing. It was fucking embarrassing. But I just thought then, these fucking priests don't know what they're on about. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, anyway, but we went to that first match. Uh, on sh- two matches we got beat on shale but the one on grass I think we won that game you know but then on the Saturday afternoon we went to see uh, Celtic Aberdeen Park I don't always remember uh, you know I think it was a draw I think it was a draw but it was Celtic singing in a walk alone and we were all out amazed at Celtic how well they sang it you know and I don't want to get into we sung it before you because I think that's a it's a futile argument <laughs> but uh it was a great experience, and Celtic sang it, I think, higher than Liverpool, like a higher pitch, if you know what I mean. And uh, we had a great time, and we stayed in a place called uh, Balak, just by Loch Lomond, and that. it was like a youth hostel, like a big uh, old house opposite, uh, looking over uh, Loch Lomond. So we all had our Celtic scarves on and went back to Balak, and obviously the priest said, get out the minibus and all that. They were in plain clothes because they'd been in the match. They hadn't worn the collars and all that. Anyway, we all get into the ship. Everyone's having a bit of a laugh, messing around, you know. And then all of a sudden, these two Black Mariahs turned up and screeched to a halt outside. And all these police run in and start grabbing us against the wall, against the wall. And did that to our priest as well, you know. And we were all thinking, what's going on here? And they're going, we've heard there's a, there's a gang from Glasgow in the area. <laughs> a razor gang, because that was all the thing in the 70s, when it razor gang, it struck fear into the uh, hearts of the community. And we were all laughing at it. So, of course, the priests were going, we're Catholic priests. You can't treat us like that. Shut up, you Fenian bastard. You know, digging the ribs or whatever. <laughs> and we were all in bulk because... These were the priests who used to bully us. At, you know, they were like the fascist dictators of the school. And now they were getting a bit of, bit of their own medicine. We couldn't stop laughing. It was absolutely hilarious, you know. But eventually they realised we were a school team. We just had Celtics. You know, we'd been in a match. They explained everything. And we I don't think they got much of an apology, but uh, they went on the way, you know. But it, it sort of like uh, undermined their authority for a while, can you say, you know. Yeah, and, you know, through your teenage years and, as I said in the introduction, you know, you, you were behind the, the end fanzine and I suppose that was kind of a Celtic fanzine score. We actually had one in the 60s called the Shamrock. Yeah. There is there is, a, there is one now called the Shamrock, but back then oh, there was yeah. one. They reckon that was the first fanzine, but the only time you'd see it is maybe if a collector has yeah, a couple yeah. of issues that come out. I got involved in fanzines in 89, but... From a lot longer than that, I remember fanzines coming into the house and there was, there was a lot of mods in the street, older mods, and they started a fanzine called Target. Yeah. And they broke into the into the secondary school and stole the photocopier. <laughs> <laughs> so they had... So That's un- entrepreneurial. They, they, well, I think they broke in first and they photocopied one of the magazines. Yeah, yeah. Said, oh, this is taking too long. Genius. So I think they stole the photocopier. I think when they were out of ink then, that was the end of, you know, a couple, the end of, the a couple of issues, but that was the end of the fans. Yeah, yeah. But I, I probably still have a couple of the fans in, and then I got involved in, in the late 80s in, in, in fans in and that, but yours was the early 80s, and yeah, probably the only thing around then was the mods in and the punk fans in. Yeah, it was. I mean, the reason I started it was because I'd become um, a youth worker in, in, uh, in Liverpool, and part of it was to do with, you know, do whatever young people want to do. Well, one of the lads who lived on the estate was a mod, and he'd started doing this uh, mod fanzine called Time for Action. Out after, this, after the Secret Affair yeah. so- song, is it? Yeah. So he'd done this, and he'd had three copies. And I knew him. His name was Phil Jones. And I thought, well, he's 17. He's doing this. He's a genius. He's a genius. He must be a genius. So I said to Phil, I said, look, you know, I'm a youth worker on the estate now. And his, his address was on the estate. 
I said, do you fancy doing, you know, uh, like a, one that's not just music, it's just observations about Liverpool life? Because I'd always seen, like, Liverpool comedians and people who did uh, student fan, student rag mags. And I don't think it captured uh, Liverpool's cruel humour. John Lennon always used to talk about the cruel humour of, like, people just attacking, you know, anything that moved, you know. And he said, ah, oh, yeah, I don't know if it would wear because, you know, people who go to match and people who go to concerts, you know, the different type, type of people. But at the time, the jam were massive and the jam were crossing over between football and music, you know. And I was sort of like saying, well, yeah, look at the jam and, you know, people who go to the jam concerts are all going to football matches, home and away, Liverpool, you know, and Everton. And he said, OK, let's give it a go. And, that. and um, because we were mentioning the stuff that related to people's lives, it was only observational. There was never one joke ever in the end, and I loved that. Even though people say it was a funny magazine, it was basically just taking the piss out of everything. We attacked everything. We attacked all the icons of Liverpool. Or you know, before it, you know, before people was were attacking Silla Black and Jimmy Tarbuck, we were on the case. You know, we had, we and we had like local DJs who were regarded as semi celebrities. They used to get hell. And, you know, years later, I found out some of them, it really affected them, it really upset them, you know, but they never came to us with any complaints. And uh, there was one DJ called Billy Butler, he was always on Radio Mirza. He, he sort of like offered us out, not offered us out, but he said, look, do an interview with me, you know. And when we interviewed him and uh, spent the night with him, we realised how his knowledge of the 60s and his knowledge of music was unbelievable, you know, and we, we sort of like warmed to him then, you know. But at the time, because we were in the 80s and they were talking about the 60s all the time, we just attacked it, you know, boring bastards going on about the 60s, you know. And it, it was just, it was a healthy, a healthy spirit of, uh, of revolution, I think, you know. And we also um, got read by a lot of people around the country and John Peel championed the various people championing, but a lot of people used to read it in the Her Majesty's institutions, you know. So it'd be passed around the wings. And then we used to start getting all these poems getting sent in and short stories of prisoners. And, so, uh, and it was always like, I've never written before, but I think you might, you know, you won't laugh at me type of thing, you know. That's so brilliant. We were getting all sorts of. And I always remember um, reading Sense of Freedom by Jimmy Boyle, you know. And he was, he was the most dangerous prisoner the um, Scottish penal institution had ever had, you know. And uh, they, did, they couldn't console him. He used to put him in straight jackets, whatever. And then they saw the sentence of Berlin in open prison. And the first thing that happened to him, he's got handed a pair of scissors. And that changed his life, he said, because someone was trusting him with, you know, instead of like attacking him, you know. So we were thinking where we were is like, you know, it's, it's redemption through writing and through art or whatever, you know, and get people, encourage people to write. Now every bastard's doing it on Facebook, aren't they? You know, it's the revolution that's gone wrong. <laughs> you know, every dickhead is writing shite on Facebook and Twitter. But, you know, you know, it's still one of those things. People are expressing themselves. It's just that there's no effort involved now. So anyone can put any else shite up. And some people believe it, don't they? And that's why you get so many. In those days when we were doing a fanzine, you know, you had to get it laid out, printed up, get it from the printers, you know, and it was a bit of an and then sell it. So I'm not advocating that, you know, Facebook is totally wrong, but I think you've got to, you've got to have a massive bullshit detected all the time, you know? Oh, big time, big time. And in the, in the lockdown now, some of the people I know, they've exposed themselves as absolute swats. You know, they really have, like, you know, I, I won't talk to them again. I won't talk to them. Yeah, I think, I think, like, Mark Bork, who's another guy, he runs Celtic Sports Clubs over here, a great guy. I had him on the podcast, and he described social media as a swamp. And I think, I think he's yeah. right, you know, and you have to dig deep in the swamp to yeah. find something good. Yeah, and I think what's kept me going through this has been some of the brilliant podcasts I've been listening to. You know, there's some fantastic ones out there, you know, and I think that's, that's the good thing that's come from it. That, you know, people said, oh, we'll do podcasts, you know, on Zoom, which, you know, in the in the past, people wouldn't have thought of that. They would have no. thought, I'll have to do a face to face with them, you know. I'd never heard of Zoom before, before the lockdown. And, uh, you, know, you have got no authority here, Andrew. We started a podcast. <laughs> we shouldn't be allowed to do this, you know. We shouldn't no. be allowed to be on the airwaves. But here we are, and people are listening, so we must be doing something right. Yeah, yeah. 
and you talk about podcasts there and the fanzine thing. I think some of the podcasts are an extension of some of the fanzines because are, yeah. some of them are really good and some of them are shy. People might think this is shy because it's not yeah. what they're into, you know. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's horses for courses. Yeah, of course. You, you talked about, you know, the, the effort that went into the fanzine. When I'd done my first fanzine, it was like I borrowed a typewriter and I was typing with one finger. Some of it was handwritten. The cover was yeah. done with marker and a print yeah. stick and I cut a picture of a, of a, of a singer called Laurel Aiken, old Jamaican singer. And I put he, didn't in break, he didn't break into a school to do this, did he? No, by then we had an unemployment resource centre. Ah, who, right, yeah. It allowed me to use the photocopier. Yeah, so yeah. I printed up 50 copies. And I remember one of my mates saying, 50 copies? He says, who the fuck is going to buy that for 50p? <laughs> and I says, oh, look, I'm going to go to pubs tonight. And we had a gig venue called a boxer club. And I says, by the time I get the boxer club, everyone will be drunk and, ch- you know, I'll try and yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll sell it to them. And I walked into a bar called The Cellars. It was kind of a rock bar. And the first person I sold it to is now my wife. Oh, right. You know, so... Love at first sight, was it? Well, she she read what I had to write. And she just, <laughs> it was my brain she fell in love with. <laughs> and I sold the 50 copies in the first pub. Yeah, so yeah. it just goes to show you that people just... It wasn't yeah. like today where you, you have just free content completely. Yeah, yeah, they just yeah. wanted something different. And I think now with some of the podcasts that started as well, that we are getting... I love... I love getting out of me walk in the morning with the dog and it's podcasts I listen to now. It used to be music, yeah, but, I do. but now I it's do. podcasts. Yeah, 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 I do. You know, so I can thank you and, and many others. Uh, people keep go back to sniffing glue, the, the, the punk fans in, but I have to thank you for laying the foundations for yeah. us that followed. We had a pretty interesting sale technique. One of my mates, Mech, who was well known at the match, he was like, he used to go up to people in queues at the footy and also at concerts and if he, if he got it like, uh, a sarcastic remark, it just go buy it, mince bags, buy it, you know. <laughs> and he's like, his chin coming out. He's like, like the fella in Great Expectations, you know, get, I'll buy it to get rid of this cunt, you know. <laughs> so, but after the after about the third or fourth, all we had to do was go into a pub by Anfield or Goodison, but she sold them at both grounds. All we had to do was go into the pub, hold one up, and people just flocked to you. You know, it was like, couldn't get enough of it, you know. We'd have a bag full of coins and then we go out in the air with the coins. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. DIY. And and, and yeah. I suppose I suppose um your music started like that as well, Peter, because people were putting down recording tapes, selling yeah. tapes, you know, yeah, yeah. demo tapes and getting them out to their mates and sending them off to radio stations or sending them to the likes of John Peel, who you said you you know was a fan of the fanzine, which is yeah, which is high praise. A fan of the fanzine. Before the group, yeah. And he was a fan of the band as well. He recorded Well, he said, he? yeah, he said that we had to get a good review in the NME or the sounds before he could give us a, a John Peel session, you know. And then when we did, he gave us a session and we did about six or seven sessions for him, you know. And that kept us going. That was like a that was like an economic lifeline for us to keep us going each year because, you know, we didn't have any business plan. We had no real idea of what to do. It wasn't until 89 where we sat down with... Uh, Kevin Sampson, the author now, and, and Suggs from Madness. And they come up with a blueprint, and we kept to that blueprint fairly well, you know, and that's because we had a bit of financial backing. Uh, was we Suggs your to, manager? He was, he was our drinking partner. <laughs> <I'd say. laughs> he used to show us around. The, he was like, it was, he was sort of manager for the first few months, but then he resigned because he said, it's either you or me manage. Because <laughs> everywhere, everywhere we went with Suggs, it was like... a he takes us around all these drinking dens in Soho, you know, and his mum was a famous jazz singer from Soho. She was chair of uh, something which BBC Two did the documentary on, and it was it was called The Slags, which it was called the Soho Ladies and Gentlemen Society. And it was all the old actors and jazz singers and all that, and she was the chairwoman of that. And they used to meet above the French house in Soho. And it's just basically a load of old thespians and drunk, you know, and his mum was the chair of that, but she was a, she was a famous jazz singer, you know, in Soho in the 50s. So Suggs was obsessed with this nightlife and this underground London. And of course, we were as well, uh, because he was showing us all these places and they were, like, they were like little, they were like basically buttons on a door. And then you go up to this labyrinth and it was Soho, it was the real Soho, you know, the you probably read about, but unless you knew where you were going, you would never have found these places. And his mum run a, run a bar called the Troy Bar, just off Oxford Street. 
And every time we went in, you know, she'd be behind the bar and she'd go, Sugsy! And he'd be going like that. She's after some money. Sugsy! <laughs> 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 and then, but it was, you know, I haven't seen you for a while, you know. And But she ran this bar, you know. And it was just a brilliant time to be in London, you know. You could actually get a drink after hours, you know, which is unheard of, you know, in the in modern London, you know, especially uh, in the last year or so, you know. But even before that, a couple of years ago, I went out to London and so it wasn't the same. There were a few little places, but a lot of them have been shut down or because of Crossrail, you know, they've they bought up the buildings and demolished them or whatever, you know. Yeah, well, it's like everything, isn't it? You like you hear about, you know, the swinging sixes in London. You hear about different scenes, the mayors you've been yeah. seen and all that. Nothing stays the same. No, you know? no, and, that- and you don't expect it to. But you know, Liverpool had some brilliant places. We had an overhead railway, which the New York and Boston railways were based on, and it was it was only demolished in the sixties, late fifties, because it was going to be too expensive to repair it because it was a private company. And like what it's all, that went the whole length, the I think nine miles of the docks, the whole length would have been a massive tourist attraction. We had a massive big customs house, basically the size of St. George's Hall, opposite Lime as big as that. That was right by the pier head, you know. All these brilliant buildings were and I suppose it's happened in in, uh, in Ireland as well. You know? Well in Dublin they 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 decided to get rid of the trams. And then yeah. decades later, they dug up the whole city and spent hundreds of millions putting yeah, the yeah, trams yeah. back in. You know, the loose, they thought, call it now. He thought they were modernising, didn't he? You know, so, I mean, just, you know, one of them. Now, why weren't they thinking of modernising in Europe? Because they've still all got, you know, so it must have been a lack of foresight or corruption or whatever going on. Here. Corruption, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Money, oh, yeah. money corrupts, doesn't it? You mentioned there you'll never walk alone. And yeah. you're right, the debate's been done to death. I don't really care who, who sings it. I, all I know is that, um, especially on the Champions League night, yeah. when, when we used to get to the Champions League, yeah, or, yeah. you know, you walk in the stadium just before kickoff and they hear that song. Yeah. You know, it's the hair it's on the back of your neck. It's just, it's just magnificent. But there's another song I want to ask you about because uh, it's, it's now played over the Tannoy in Celtic Park, the Pete Diggers. Yeah. Four leaf clover on my chest. Yeah. yeah is, that a Liverpool, is that a Liverpool song? Well, it's an interesting story, this, because um, one of my mates, Sandy Davis, is in the Pete Diggers. And I met him, first of all, I think it was, probably was in the 80s when I was doing the end. And he came down to Liverpool with, uh, he was like a drug rehabilitation worker. And he came down to Liverpool. So I got friendly with him. And he was, I knew he was a Celtic fan and all that. So I kept in touch with him, you know. And when I got married, he came down in 92 to play the bagpipes at my wedding and all that. So I've always kept in touch with them, you know. Anyway, 97, uh, we got drawn against um, Celtic. Uh, and so he said, he rang me up and said, any chance of us getting a gig in Liverpool? So I thought, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. And, it's, you know, I said, what, what do you want to play? You know, he said, any any bar which is, in, you know, inclined towards Irish music would be good, you know. So I got in touch with the management of uh, this place called... Um, uh, Kitty O'Shea's in Liverpool. Sounds like an Irish. Uh, yeah, it was. It was only it being called Flares before that. It was a seventies disco bar, and they, that had run its course. So they thought, <laughs> "What? What should we do now?" I know. And Liverpool didn't really have. It had one of the first Irish bars called Flanagan's, which was um, a fella set that up because he based on the New York bars, the Irish New York bars, and he set it up. And it, it took so much money in Liverpool that. All around the, uh, Europe, uh, the breweries were saying, coming over to Liverpool, to saying, you know, to have a look at it, to t- to copy it. That's why every every um, major city in Europe has got an Irish bar, isn't it? Not just because they are popular, because in 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 the eighties, the this pub in Matthew Street in Liverpool called Flanagan's took so much money that it became the template for the Irish bars around Europe. And the fellow who set that up was a seafarer, Cunard Yank, they called him. And he had an Irish background. Uh, and he set it up because he was working as a waiter on the Cunard ships. And he ended up living in New York and setting up an Irish bar in, in New York. And he'd seen how popular they were. Come back to Liverpool and just copied it, you know. Um, anyway, Kitty O'Shea's wasn't one of his, but it was a similar thing, you know. So I got them, uh, I got them a gig. And then 11 o'clock in the morning, they're setting up, you know. Uh, they set up. I got there about one o'clock. By the time I got there, the pub had been drunk dry already. <laughs> there was hundreds of people, mainly Celtic fans, 
And the manager said to me, why didn't you tell me? Said, why didn't you tell you more? He said, they had a big following. I said, it's just, you know, because the match is on, you know. Everyone said, oh, the Pete tickets are playing here. So they've all headed here, you know. So anyway, they restocked on the ale. And we listened to Celtic songs all day, all day. And they were absolutely magnificent. And Liverpool fans were saying to me, my God, how many songs have these got? You know, it's unbelievable, you know. And we'd listen to them all day. Then we went to the match. Um, I can't remember the score. Was it two? Uh, Celtic won in 2003, didn't we? But it was nil-nil at Anfield, wasn't yeah. it? You went through under McManaman and won the goal. That's it. Or, uh, at Celtic, because I'd been to that match as well, which is another story I can tell you about. <laughs> if, you've got, if you've got time. But uh, anyway, of course we have. the Pete Diggers were there. And uh, after the match, we went back. They'd stocked up on the Orly Ale and that. And but there was more Liverpoolians in after the game, you know, and not as many Celtic fans. So I think the Pete Diggers played away and it was going down great. And then one of my mates said, uh, do, you re- do you reckon they'll let me get up and sing the song? And I said, Yeah, just go and ask them. So I said to Sandy, It's all right if he gets up and sing uh, sings a Liverpool song. And he went, Yeah, yeah. So we sang this song called uh, Live a Bird Upon My Chest. A live a bird upon my chest. We are men, Bill Shankly's best, a team that plays the Liverpool way and win the league and the cup in May. And that's basically the core, you know, but, and then there's about eight verses. So we'd listen to these brilliant Celtic songs all day. And then Sandy and everyone listened to that and went, oh my God, that is unbelievable. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. So he, he, uh, Sandy said to me, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to Glasgow and I'm going to record that and, and change the lyrics to uh, Celtic lyrics and I said brilliant do it and he sent me when they did it he sent me the CD I've still got it Four Leaf Clover and I didn't think any, much of it I didn't think much of it and then a couple of years later I switched the telly on and I don't know if it was the Champions League or Europa League and there's Celtic fans at the beginning of a match all singing Four Leaf Clover and I went oh my god because Liverpool fans never sang I'll have a bear upon my chest in the ground too complicated, really, because it's eight bit, whatever. But um, they sang it in pubs and on coaches and going to away matches or whatever, but they never sang it in the ground. And I went, fucking hell, Celtic are singing that. How brilliant is that, you know? I said, but, you know, I didn't think people would know the story. And that's the story. And the only person who could really confirm that would be Sandy from the Pete Diggers, who is on Facebook, if you want to confirm it with him. Because he's been on Facebook telling people that is that is true. So you've robbed two of our songs. Yeah, possibly, <laughs> possibly. And we, but you know, we've, uh, but Fields of Athen, right? Fields of Anfield Road. It oh. was because of Celtic, I think. We'll give you that one. When we went to, we went in '97. We went to Birds, and then uh, we also went to the the old barn around the corner. Because Sandy said Birds is a bit of a touristy thing, you know, it's great. But... It's closed now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I know it is through due to an incident or something. Well, but anyway, I looked it up the other day to see if it was still open, but I heard it was closed. But we went to the old barn, and he also told us to go to uh, the Brazen Head. It's still open. My mate's that pub. still open? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mate's pub. Yeah. And he told us to go that, and we loved it there, and we loved the old barn. It was great as well. Birds. When we saw Birds, and then had all the newspaper cuttings on the wall, and all. We thought Liverpool hasn't got anything like this. So um, a few years ago, a lad opened a bar in Liverpool called the Twelfth Man, which is right by the ground. It's called the Salisbury, really, originally, but it's known as the Twelfth Man now. He's changed the name to the Twelfth Man. And we got all photographs and reminiscent of birds upstairs. So we got all the old newspaper Liverpool echoes when we won the cup and all that. Very similar to Birds, but not as extensive. You know, Birds was like done at the time when it was happening, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, well, Birds, Birds was like, as you say, like it was. He's he's right in what, as well what he says. You know, it was a touristy bar, it was full stop. You know, when when you got to to Glasgow, if you had someone yeah. with you, you know, that was the first game. Always t- well, our two roadies for the farm with uh, the Dunn brothers, and they were Celtic fans, and they'd always take us to Birds as well if we were ever playing. Uh, it was great in a non-match day as well. See if you were yeah. there for the day after game when just the locals were in. Yeah. You know, it was brilliant. But Kane the Leash done a press conference in there. Fame I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe there. so. I can't imagine. I can't imagine that happening now. <laughs> you know, um, full of uh, what do we say? Full of characters. Yeah, as legend has it, Tommy Carby owned it and when he was in court, when it was been, you know, the judge says, have you anything yeah. else to say? 
and he says, Baird's Bar is a pub in the east end of Glasgow, not a wine bar in the west end of Glasgow. <laughs> and that was the, that, I don't know how true that is, but that's yeah, what we're yeah. told he said in court, you know. Brilliant, brilliant. What a top bloke Peter is and what a passionate bloke he is about football, music, everything, politics, social scene. Oh, he's just full of passion and it was just great to chat to him. And if you enjoyed the first part, make sure you tune in next Friday because Peter uh, actually played with Jimmy Johnson and he wore the Celtic jersey, not the Liverpool one. So that's a fascinating story. But also on a serious note, Peter opens up about his experience of Hillsborough. He was in the crowd that day and he talks a little about the effect it had on the city. So as I said, don't forget to tune in for that one. Thank you so much to everyone who bought the latest issue of the fanzine, More Than 90 Minutes, issue 113. It's still available, I think, as I come into the studio, there's six copies sitting on my desk, so it would be great to sell out again, folks. And you can also buy the digital copy to download by visiting the website, shatticfanzine.com. As always, I would like to thank Ronan McQuillan for producing the show. If you like what we're doing and you would like to support us, you could do so visit the website selectfansing.com where you can become a member, subscribe, buy or donate for the price of a point. And folks, I, I just can't thank you enough for the support you've been giving us. Don't forget to visit our website for articles and news and you can also sign up for our newsletter. And don't forget to download the app. It's free and you'll have access to all the podcasts, articles, daily news, video content, info on upcoming events, the fanzine and our online shop all at the touch of a button on your phone or tablet. All episodes of the podcast are now available on all platforms so hit the subscribe or follow button. You'll never miss an episode. And if you can, leave a five-star review. I see we're flying up the Apple charts. Please also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or on LinkedIn. Details are all in the podcast description. Don't forget to keep a lookout for the Celtic Soul Shots on social media, which are snippets of conversations we've had with guests since we started back in the summer. And also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've been out and about this week getting some bits of content done within our 5k radius so once we're, once we're ready with some decent content we don't want to go down the same route as everyone else we just want to do something a little different a little refreshing not that saying wrong with what everyone else is doing I'm just assuming that at this stage once again folks if your business Celtic Supporters Club like the podcast and would like to become a sponsor please email us at info at CelticFansing.com you can also contact us through the website or message us on social media if you have enjoyed the conversation today with our guest Peter Hooten and you would like to listen to more of the same, can I suggest episode 54, a couple of weeks back when we spoke to Johnny Owen. Back in episode 37, we spoke to Average Joe Miller. And we also spoke to Aaron McCusker, who opened up his Celtic Soul to us back in episode 17. It's Dundee United in Tanadice this Sunday, midday kickoff, as John Kennedy heads into his second game in charge of Celtic. So, listeners, just close your eyes there for a minute and dream of an away day. The two-hour spin up from Glasgow to Dundee, few beers in the bus, tape playing the tunes, chat outside Tanadice and a burger to soak up the early morning beer before going into the old ground, shouting and singing for 90 minutes. Great days, they seem closer now with the vaccine in play, dot dot dot, hopefully. Each episode we want to lend our support to musicians, performers, songwriters out there who have been hit the hardest by the lockdown restrictions, no gigs, no venues. So send in your material and we'll give you a plug and we'll stick all your details in the podcast description. So folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting us. Stay safe. Keep the faith. And this week, we'll play out with the farm classic all together now.
together now All together 